Welcome to week eight and welcome to the product. This is the core of the marketing mix and functionally, this is the linchpin that keeps the whole marketing process together. In the definition of marketing, we talk about the creation, communication and delivery and exchange of an offering that has value. The product is the offering that has value. Now products cover a spectrum. They cover physical objects, which you usually refer to as goods. They cover services, which are the application of skills. They cover ideas, which are the concepts, thoughts. They cover experiences, which is the merger in many aspects. It's the outcome. So you go to a movie, you're buying an experience. You buy the DVD, you're buying a good that can let you replay the experience later. You're buying an embedded service. You go to watch a play, you're buying a service. You listen to a campaign slogan and go, I like that, I'm going to vote for that person. You're buying into an idea. So at the heart, you need to have a product to do marketing. You can use different elements of the marketing mix and different elements of marketing, different component pieces, but if you don't have a product back at the center, you don't have marketing taking place. So that's one of the most important things to factor in here is there has to be a product. And the product has to exist in some way as either physical goods delivered to the individual either mediated or direct as a service, a deliberately stated concept, idea or framework, or an emotional state change, an intentionally induced emotional state change as an experience. Now why this is really super important to us is that inside the core theories and the core ideas of product, We've been interweaving this particular framework, the, the product concept, has been part of a sequence of prior ideas. So in consumer behavior, functionally what we're looking for is an understanding of the consumer's needs and wants so that we can offer them a product. We use segmentation, targeting, and positioning to take that product take our understanding of a small slice of the overall market and create them a product that meets those needs and which sits somewhere within a positioning map as a possible way that they could gain benefit, get benefit. We also straight up in the first couple of weeks discussed around the idea of new product or existing product. So the Ansoft matrix starts from this position of, do we already offer something? Do we need to offer something new? And the something is the product. If we look at things like social media, social media is an idea product or an experience product. We look at the elements around external analysis, around internal analysis, around market research. Frequently, we are looking at things that will impact upon our ability to create a product or our ability to deliver a product. But functionally, without a product in mind, we can't do a lot of these things because we need there to be a context to marketing's activities. We've left the detail of product until later in the book so that some of the foundational ideas like consumer behavior, like needs, wants, have been explored, and now you can see them contextualized. So the other thing that we want to draw your attention to is this idea that product beget strategy. Now, obviously, strategy will dictate products, but the tactics and products are also closely aligned. A strategy is the number of products you have available across your organization. And within those products, the number of variants on a theme that you have. So those are two strategic decisions, but they are also 
then driven by the idea of market segmentation, by benefit segmentation, by understanding how many variants your market will tolerate and how many segments that creates. So each object that you create, each product that you put into the lineup is in of itself a segmentation variable. So the users of 600 mil can, six, well, if we go to the um, Pepsi Max example, we have the 375 mil, the 450 mil, the 200 mil, three different types of cans. Two different types of small bottles, 390 and 600 mil. Two different types of large bottles, 1.25 and 2 litre. Then we have the packaging bundling, the fact that you can buy a six pack of cans, a 12, 8, 24 and 30 combination of cans in the 375 mil range, but you can only access the 490 ones individually. It's all strategy, it's all niche, not so much niche, it's all market segment. So products can create their own segments. The use of a product creates a segment, so value and benefit-based segmentation. Over on the tactics side, we start looking at things like what does the product need to have in the way of features? What are the value offerings that it's creating? What are the variants that we can do by modifying one or two features to create alternative levels of value, different levels of value? And to do that, We've got a really, this is a robust fundamental model. And the idea of it being robust is that it tolerates quite a lot of adaptation and it can be used to describe any product along the spectrum from physical good through to experience because it operates at the three levels. At the heart of the model is the core customer value. And we're going to talk through each step, overview, then into detail. The core customer value is also the area where people most frequently run into trouble, where they will want to focus on a trait or attribute of the product that's best considered part of the actual product instead of focusing on the benefit someone receives. So the core customer value is all about the value in use and the value, the co-created value of what do I get out of the consumption of this product. So that's really, it's the core customer value because it's driven by the customer. The actual product is driven by the marketer. This is the traits, elements and artifacts of the object. Concepts such as the brand name, the features, the packaging, the level of quality, the design, all of those sit together to form what the product is in terms of an offering. So if you think of the core as the value, the actual is the offering. At the augmented and associated level are extensions to the product. There are ways and means by which we can complicate this, but if we think about physical goods, physical goods, the core value is its use, the actual product is its ownership, and all the features that come with it. So something as absolutely basic as you can a Pepsi Max, size of the product, the brand, what it says to be drinking Pepsi versus drinking Coke, the features, the level of caffeine, the flavour, whether it's refrigerated or not refrigerated, the quality, does it taste like the last can, will it taste like the next can? It's really disturbing when it doesn't. You always have that moment, it's like, oh, wait, what? And the design. 
They've been through multiple, de that's the other thing is that we have been through multiple designs of cans in order to serve the same volume of liquid, but we have now sort of settled on a, a design. The augmented, so that's the features. And again, I'm focusing on physical goods for a moment because we can complicate things by bringing services in, but we'll go to that in a moment, later. Augmented and associated. Now these are the aspects, to a certain extent, the brand could sit over here at the associated services, but it's things like if there are warranties and guarantees, if you can get your money back if you're not satisfied with the product's use. Uh, they're extensions, they're not what do we necessarily buy it to do, but they are things that can enhance the purchase of. These days it's things that also would include things like supply chain reputation. Uh, you know, you could say organic would sit as the actual product. Proof of organic supply would be the associated service. Now let's get into the breakdown. Let's, let's talk about the, the keys. So at the heart, the core product. Customers buy the capacity to produce benefits. There is the old saying that the customer doesn't buy a three and a quarter inch drill bit, they buy the capacity to produce three and a quarter inch holes. But the idea here fundamentally is to get us to move away from thinking about what we offer to thinking about how the customer will respond to that offer. And this is about market orientation. This is the idea of the customer orientation writ large is it's not our features that are the most important thing. It's the customer's use of those features. It's what they get out of that product that matters. So this brings us to a whole series of uh, almost philosophical level and there's questions around art. If I buy a piece of art, do I have to leave it as it was? Can I reuse it? Can I create something else from it? Uh, the doctrine of first sale, the concept, there's a lot of frameworks here. But fundamentally for marketers the big question is what's in it for the customer to buy our product and is that of interest to them? And is it of sufficient value to them for them to pay us the money? So this is why co-creation of value was such an important framework, is that this turned us away from saying objects are fait accompli. Objects are done once we produce them, we produce them, we sell them, job done, go home everybody. This now becomes a case of in-service dominant logic, we create the opportunity. We make something that has potential. The potential gets realized when it gets used. So that then requires us to ensure that our customers have the capacity to unlock that potential. That value exists where the customer uses our product to create, to deliver a service to themselves, and this is the, then becomes the fundamental notion of the features are secondary, entirely secondary to what the customer can do with those features. But it also creates this idea that now we've got more pressure on the customer that we can actually push back a little bit and say, well, you didn't use the product right. You didn't get the product right. Therefore, you know, we gave you something, we, we sold you a product, but you didn't use the product correctly, therefore you have failed your co-creation task, it's not our responsibility. So there's a little, there, there are some things that that notion of service dominant logic create and does open up some ethics questions of can we sell an object that the customer can't use or can't reasonably be expected to use to get or can't unlock the value without needing a certain skill level, can we sell it and still claim to have delivered value? And this is where coming back to one of the exercises that was run very early in the semester is the notion of value. 
Again, here we're just going to focus on the three, and that is the value in use. Well, the core benefit, the core product, comes from the value that the product provides by being used. Then there's the value that the product provides in what we can trade it for. Money for goods, goods for money, but even a sense of certain products are more valuable when you are giving them to someone else. So exchange becomes a, a the ultimate question here is the birthday gift, the value in use or the value in exchange? Well, the answer is value in exchange. Our value of this object is entirely based on the benefit it helps us provide to another. And lastly is value and ownership, sheer possession. The ability to access that value co-creation when you feel like, as you feel like, but also its mere presence creates value by pre its presence. So it's unlocking, it's I'm using it, therefore there's value. I'm trading it to someone, therefore it's value. Merely having it, therefore value. So how do we get there? Well, we get that by having an actual product. Now for us, a couple of the things around the actual product that we want to think about is this idea around value is the usability of the product. Now the ultimate uh, usability question on a product happens to be the USB drive because if you can ever if you've ever had the situation of taking three goes to put a USB drive into a machine, turning it over, over and back over, it should have worked the first time if it works the third time. But the usability of a product comes from the idea of can we unlock the value? Yes, we can fumble this thing around a few times in the USB slots and eventually get there. So long as it can read the data that's on the drive, it's valuable. As long as that data lets us do something, it's valuable. We also run into elements around this idea of product quality, uh, perception of quality versus actual quality. Perceived quality is the eye of the beholder. And there is a certain level, uh, well, there's an absolute level of, of, of subjectivity there. Actual quality can be things around uh, objectivity. There can be certain things that, you know, when we're talking about medical grade or meet certain requirements or uh, you know, the actual quality, yes, it's made of stainless steel. Is it all stainless steel? Yes, then it's 100% stainless steel. It meets that requirement. You can, there are certain elements of quality that can be objective if there are structural requirements to the product. For the most part as marketers, we deal a lot with perceived quality. We deal with that interplay between what something costs to acquire, relative scarcity of it, or scarcity of its core components, and that's partly how quality is perceived. It was expensive, it must be good. It's good, therefore it must be expensive. Or the difference between what we're expecting. Oh, it's reasonably low cost, it can't be that good, or oh, it's better than I expected. The features, uh, this is also the bit where the features are put on at the factory. So coming back to my little USB key here, the features are, it's eight gig, which means it can contain most of the things I want to transport. It comes with a bunch of different labels and things on it, explaining to me what its features are. But the bottom line is, placing machine, it works. That's the feature I want, and it creates the value when it does that. As for the brand, I just love the fact that somebody created a brand verbatim as a data duplication brand. But that passes on meaning. The brand in its own right can be the product that you're purchasing. Now, I don't know what the value of a Nike uh, USB key would be, but I do know that you could sell a Versace one for a ridiculous price because sometimes we buy the name because the actual product that we want 
is the ability to socially communicate a message of our personal wealth, our personal positioning statement, and our personal overall image. You also note that for the most part, I try and avoid brand. I, I do tend not to either endorse or state brands because it's very easy for me to cut a brand apart and that isn't fair to the brand, but it also isn't fair to the consumers who are now sitting there going, awkward, that's my brand. Um, my lecturer just carved my entire reputation, my shirt's entire reputation apart. Ah, awkward. So the feature benefit split, this is a really um, important thing to consider, is this is also where marketers, when we talk about integration inside the firm, Features versus benefits is where you've got to grab your lawyer by the scruff of the neck and hang on to them because when a customer uses the product and they get benefit, marketers, we're happy. But if you've ever read the back of a product and it says, for intended use only, then that means there's a bunch of unintended uses. Uh, it's also the way my mind works. Is like. Intended use only, ah, unintended uses. If the customer uses your product in a way you weren't expecting and unlocks a set of features that you didn't realize were there and they gain a bunch of benefits that you didn't know you were selling, we call it use innovation and sometimes the lawyers call it a field day. Uh, there have been a number of cases where people have sued, companies have sued their customers because their customers were using the products inappropriately and created additional use innovations or use values that they hadn't considered. As a marketer, my idea is if they're doing that, you write it down, you ask the people who created and brought it to your attention how much reputation gain they'd like to have. Uh, whether we need to pay them cash for that reputation gain or whether we can just give them a reputation gain and then bring them in and go nice use of the product. So co-creation is also an aspect where lawyers get nervous and marketers get excited. Branding, now the brand, the technical definition of a brand is the recognizable mark a literal translation of the thing that you used to slap on the side of a cow to mark the cow as yours, which also meant that there were a bunch of ways in which you could fraudulently mark a cow. We'll come to that later. But branding, it's important to understand that branding is part of the product's value. It is also a function of the integrated marketing communication strategy. So what you create is you create a product that is identifiable through the marks and markers on it, be it color, text, image, or whatever. That brand communicates a message to the market. And as marketers, we can also use that brand to communicate this message, to reinforce the message through our integrated marketing communication strategies. The marketing mix is interconnected and overlaps. The other thing with branding is that branding allows us to increase the price. A brand helps with the positioning strategy. We often do positioning matrices of brands versus brands. Where does where did the different brands line up on a two by two matrix? And lastly, the brand might be the thing that people are buying. Brands are markers that allow for the signifying of in group or out group status. You can have anti brands, you can have brands you wear to mark yourself as an outsider, or your absence of branding can be used to mark yourself as an outsider. Whereas your, you can mark yourself as an insider with brands, logos, and images. All of these are things of value. Customers who have strong affiliation needs feel better about themselves and their lives if they have an affiliation marker. So they will pay more for a brand to give them the benefit of 
affiliation marking. So everyone who has ever walked around the place in a sporting jersey has marked themselves as affiliated to that team. And this is how we sell teams and sports. This is how we end up with consumer teams and consumer the brand versus brand, the us versus them, the, the Star Wars versus Star Trek, the Apple versus, well, it's kind of funny. It used to be Apple versus IBM, but it's now Apple versus Microsoft, hardware versus software, Coke versus Pepsi. All the sort of, the idea of the versing is by my brand marker, I have aligned myself to a team, therefore I have teams compete and there is a contest, therefore there is a team in opposition to me. And if you've got a strong us-them affiliation need, brands are magnificent ways to meet and satisfy that need. On the other end is brands also are used for cognitive shortcuts. So in consumer behaviour, when we talked about the decision-making process, being able to ID your brand from a distance. So I know walking into a venue, if I can spot that light blue, that silver and light blue combination in the bar fridge, just on oh, walking up to the bar, I'm eyeing off the back fridge. If I can see that color combination, long before my eyes can focus on the, the logo, I know there's something to drink. So it's a cognitive shortcut. It also, if I see the silver and blue on another product lineup, I've got a reasonably confident chance that oh, it might be Red Bull. If I see any of the logos and brands that I recognize on products that I don't, it's the, how the brand extension works, is that I have a certain set of associations I make with a product. I use the brand logo and this is how we work as humans, is the brand logo becomes a visual image, quick stimuli, quick shortcut. You see the logo, it preloads all the information you need to know. The logo's on a new product you don't recognize, but you, will, you go, well, I can probably associate my previous experience across. The bro we mentioned the social messaging, what's you know, using your product to affiliate yourself in group out group, but also the brands themselves do have a straight pragmatic thing of, I can walk into the store and identify the thing that I had previously, I recognize the logo, I can buy the thing again. All right, inside the product, the packaging of a product is also um, heavily connected to distribution. In fact, Amazon's packaging is entirely about distribution. The boxes, the box shapes, and the everything else, and the, sometimes the fact that they will ship you a micro USB drive in the box the size of a small car is entirely about how many other things were in the back of the truck. So their packaging is driven by logistics channeling. Other people's packaging can be done for functional and feature where you use the package to convey information, convey branding. Uh, the mere existence of unboxing videos says that packaging is in itself a feature that you can sell to a customer. So there are a whole bunch of distribution crossovers here in packaging in terms of shipping logistics. There's crossover into promotion in terms of branding, and there's crossover in terms of price. The higher you pay for the higher price you pay, the more uh, the packaging has to reflect the value. So, if you're paying ridiculous amounts of money for an object, chances are the packaging itself is going to be quite expensive, which, in essence, is kind of ridiculous as long as it gets the job done. But you also have the idea of minimalistic packaging and excessive packaging, uh, individual packaging, the there are many, many issues in here. Uh, there's a whole sequence of ethics-based issues around 
packaging which enables support for uh, people with access needs, so pre-chopped, pre-packaged, pre-wrapped versus single-use plastic use. So th there's a bunch of challenges. Basically, you can be doing something absolutely ethical and right by your market because your market has a particular need. Again, I come back to the pre-packaged, pre-chopped fruit and vegetables. That is supporting a number of different markets who have access requirements, who have difficulty holding blades, who have difficulty chopping and preparing food. So your packaging's right for them. But for a bunch of other audiences and stakeholders, the packaging is wrong because they're looking at going, well, a pre-peeled, well, what if it, we just didn't peel it? It's like, well, we're selling something to people who can't unpeel selling to people who can't peel an orange. We're selling this product pre-peeled in packaging so they can access oranges. The ethics are there and something you need to be aware of because the, the packaging can also be a feature of the product, a benefit of the product, and a cost of the product. So to wrap it up, product is one of those aspects of marketing that there's a lot of very quick to understand, lifetime to master um, so theories and concepts and frameworks. Top of the list is the one place people have fallen down time and time again is trying to put a feature where the core product goes. Core product, co-creation value, what is it that the customer uses your product for? What benefits do they gain? That's your core product. That's your fundamental marketing. That's what you're looking for is, why would someone use my product? What do they get out of it? Once you understand that, then you can start thinking, well, OK, who else would want this? What else can I offer to those audiences? And that's how we get down the path of meeting the needs of multiple market segments through the Ansoft matrix.